I'm going to talk about Beatitudes. Now, does anybody here, when you hear the word Beatitudes, think of any other section of Scripture apart from Matthew? There is a list of Beatitudes, and they're not at all well known. But nevertheless, they are Beatitudes, and interestingly, there are seven of them. Now, for Seventh-day Adventists, as for many Christians, that number seven always sounds a warning. Now, did you realise the Beatitudes in Matthew, there are at least eight, if not nine. So what I'm going to present to you this morning is more complete, more perfect than what you would gather from a study of Matthew 5. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's being a bit uh, big-headed, isn't it? What I would like you to do is open your Bibles and the boys out the back will show up on the screen Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Now, all of you here are sitting with an air of expectancy. You are waiting for something to happen. And probably you reflected on that while you were going through the Sabbath school lesson this morning. Well, I certainly hope you all studied the Sabbath school lesson in class this morning. What must soon take place? He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. As we work our way through these Beatitudes, these things only happened because of the cross. You need to keep that in mind. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. So I'm happy, I get to be blessed because I'm doing precisely that. But now it barrels back to you guys. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Other translations may say the time is at hand. Those three or four words have engendered in Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, if you want to separate the two classes of believers, a sense, this air of expectancy, and not only an air of expectancy, but what do we need to do while we are waiting? Now, the problem is, of course, that this waiting has been going on for 2,000 years. So it's not altogether unexpected that there would be people running around. Well, the waiting will soon end. The prophecies all point out that there will be an end and it will come. And our history tells us it was going to come in 1844 and then at some time after that and then at some time after that. But it still hasn't happened. So there's a a feeling that there are at least a couple of words that we're not quite sure that we've gotten to grips with. One of those words is time and the other is the word near or soon or at hand. And so we put those two words together. The time is at hand. We mentioned in our Sabbath school class this morning that there are some people who get so caught up 
with the lack of things coming to pass while they're waiting, that they give up the waiting and they give up the church. And the difficulty is for somebody in my place who is reading these words that it is difficult to convince people who are absolutely convinced in their own minds that they do understand it. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 13. You've been told that you are going to be blessed because you are hearing these words. Now let's have a look at Revelation 14. Now you realise that the opening verses were from the very first chapter, but that word beatitude doesn't get mentioned now for another 13 chapters. So whatever was happening, these next six beatitudes are compacted in some way. Whether it is compacted in time or the scope of prophecy is something that we need to get to grips with. But Revelation chapter 14, and I'm going to read from verse 9 through to 13. Now these are familiar words to Seventh-day Adventists. We've had uh, occasions where the three angels' messages have been focus of some outreach programs that we've had. And I'm going to stick with the third angel at the moment. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Now, if you stop and try to imagine that situation, it's not one that strikes you with enthusiasm. Indeed, you have a sense of dread. And yet we like to believe we don't want to scare anybody into heaven. So maybe we water the message down a little bit. Hard to say. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. You see what we do with messages? Forever and ever. We like to tell people that that doesn't mean it will never end. And already we have trouble getting to grips with what scripture is saying to us. Because in our way of thinking... Messages are always for the other blokes. We know what they're doing wrong. If they don't change their mind once I share the gospel with them, they'll just be tormented forever and ever. The Bible says so. Most of us never wake up to the reality that we could possibly be out of step with Scripture ourselves. But we refuse also to face the reality that if those blokes are going to suffer forever and ever, oh, oh, that could happen to me. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Now the highlight in this section is in verse 12, but also more specifically, verse 13. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. How many people here would not like to be called a saint? So I've got to phrase that question so you all keep your hands down. All right, flip it. How many people would want to put up their hands and say, I'm a saint? One, two, oh, I like this one. <laughs> you see, I can stand up here and put it all the way up there and all you people can see my hand flouncing around and you say, oh, well, he's the preacher. But you see, 
Have we lost confidence in our message? Does it not strike us the way it struck Ellen White and her fellow pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Does it not strike us the same way as it has done in the hearts of Christians for well nigh on 2,000 years? And where the, how we answer that question often is dependent on how we understand the rest of verse 12. So you don't like being saints. You don't want to put your hands up. So how many of you would like to put up your hands and say, I obey God's commandments? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Uh, as an evangelistic program... We're achieving an increase in numbers by about, I think there was two before, there was three this time. So that's great, 50%. And remain faithful to Jesus. How many would put their hands up and say, I remain faithful to Jesus? Oh, we're getting there, we're getting there. You see... The problem with waiting for so long is that we're apprehensive about how we need to go about our waiting. And it's interesting in Revelation 14 here, the highlight verse says, Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, scribble this down on a piece of paper, pass it around so everybody can see what you're writing. Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Now, it has been said, and I don't know how true it is because I'm still alive to speak about it, but it has been said that once you die, it's all over. Finished. You don't need to worry about anything else. And that is essentially true up to a point. And as we go through some more of these <laughs> words from the scripture, now I've got to apologise and I've been taught not to do this, but if you have problems following me and I forget a word or something, don't be scared to uh, yell out what is the word I've forgotten. Blessed, that's the word. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labour for their deeds will follow them. Now most Christians are happy to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they will acknowledge that he died on the cross for them and they accept that. The problem that people who observe and study Seventh-day Adventism, the problem for them is, in these words, their deeds will follow them. They're dead, but their deeds will follow them. So does that mean their, dead, their deeds also have died? Or does that also mean possibly that their deeds will be a testimony for them? Yeah, yeah good, good. Everybody likes that idea. The point being is that if you have lived a life as a nominal Christian, I'll start off at that point, I guess, then you're happy if nobody talks about what you have done in your life because that way you won't get into any trouble. It's a bit like the, the funeral service I went to. You sit through a two-hour service where the bulk of it was all about this man whom I knew, who was of an age as I am, I could only ever on that evidence of those people who took part in that service. This was a man of God. 
And I think, I wonder whether he was like that when I was at college with him. Because you tend to try and move yourself away from being impacted by somebody else's life. So you deflect a little bit. But this is the problem. If you come to a social occasion at a Seventh-day Adventist church, there will be people who will get together, two or three together, maybe four, and they will talk. Oh, Seventh-day Adventists like to talk. The problem is, it has been an ongoing problem that they like to talk to somebody about somebody else, not Jesus. One of the most difficult things I can remember from my early years uh, as a Seventh-day Adventist, and I was baptised the day after my 24th birthday, is that people at church, after church, never spoke about what Jesus meant to them. And I slotted into that situation quite easily. If you don't speak about something, you're not going to get any trouble. But we are called, I mean, the revelator was called to write, but we are called to speak. But the point being in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 13, is that keeping the prophecy needs patient endurance in both obedience and faith. Revelation 16, verses 13 to 16. If ever there is anything that I remember vividly from the Bible studies that I took part in as uh, the church pastor wanted to lead me into making a commitment, I always remember the three unclean frogs. And it was a fascinating sort of illustration. And they taught me what it all stood for, the Catholic Church, Protestantism, spiritualism or spiritism as it is sometimes called. But I don't hear so much about that nowadays. Because like all of this, where we want to read in, we'll say, the Roman Catholic Church, we are always going to be in danger that if time goes beyond an individual's allotted lifespan, then maybe there will be a reinterpretation. But that's not the point. It is how we look at the people that we associate with in their relationship to God? And do people try to tell us whether we are right or wrong or misled or whatever? But do we also do the same thing? Do we try to tell other people that once we know what their denominational affiliation is, they say, oh, Okay, brother, sister, um, uh, okay, look, I'll come and study with you later on and see if we can help you understand. We are changing our emphases. We are changing. I've been an Adventist for now almost 60 years. And I'm rather thankful that opportunities like today only come my way very rarely because I'm half expecting that a wonky knee will start to collapse under me or that the asthma and the COPD will leave me breathless. My age, I know, is always already leaving me with uh, faulty memory. But the things that stay with you, these three unclean frogs, there are 
organisations, not individuals, organisations who are working under the influence of Satan and his angels to get as many people out of our church as is possible to get. And I want to read specifically now verse 15. Now, this is, in my NIV, written in red. So if you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, theoretically, you are led to believe that this is Jesus speaking. And I'm not going to tell you it's not. The, the difficulty with this is how it fits in. Now, what does it say? Behold, I come like a thief. We've had that sort of analogy presented to us in our Bible studies and Sabbath school lessons over the years. We, we know what that means. It means that wherever we find ourselves, somebody is creeping up on us to catch us unawares. But when it is Jesus saying that he is coming like a thief, do we stop and think, am I going to be caught out because I couldn't discern the signs of his coming? That is what the warning is because Jesus goes on to say, blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Stay awake, stay dressed, don't be exposed and go back and study the Laodicean message for some more insight onto that. Revelation chapter 19, <coughs> verses 6, six to 10. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. This is in the present tense. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. That is in the present tense. That is now. Whatever the context of these this particular chapter, we can say this is now. The time is here. Not just at hand. Not just near. Each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, will go through times when they will reflect which is a good sort of positive word, on their situation in life. If they are game and truthful, they will acknowledge that things have not gone the way we would have liked. But here in this section of Revelation, we're being brought to view with what it will be like. Just how far off, we don't know. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And most of you know whom we're referring to as far as the bride is concerned. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Now, generally in a human marriage, there are only a very select few people who are allowed to see the bride prior to the wedding itself. Possibly her mother, bridesmaid, maids, mother-in-law to be, women essentially. And I've always found it fascinating that Christianity appeals more to women than it does to men. But that's the way of it. That's life. But fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So you're going to be looking 
while you're sitting down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, this vast congregation of people, and you can see the bride, which is that vast congregation of people. And you're thinking to yourself, do I know? I, I, do I recognise that person? Oh, that was the one I diddled when I sold him a cheap thing for twice its value. Uh, probably you won't recall that so easily. But you may have just as much difficulty saying, ah, look, there's Tonya. I remember her. She played... Uh, uh, it doesn't matter, she sent her son over to America, so that made things easy on the household. But just imagine sitting down. Would you really be concerned about your righteous acts? Or would you be celebrating that all this vast congregation are people who performed righteous acts under the inspiration of the Spirit and in company with fellow saints. Oh yes, I remember you were there. Oh yes. You see these people that you do remember. These were people who performed righteous acts. I talked about my friend from college, a, whole, a, a man of God, I called him. Nobody who said anything about him really called him that, but really when they wanted to talk about Roy as a person, they talked about the things that he did. The righteous acts that set him apart from others. Stay awake. Stay dressed. Don't be exposed. Revelation, oh, the other thing about Revelation 19 is uh, there are four hallelujahs. And I like these little tidbits that you pick up in your Bible study. I think it's here in my NIV notes. Hallelujah occurs four times in verses 1 to 6 but nowhere else in the New Testament. It means praise the Lord. Can we draw from that note that not a lot of people were saying praise the Lord? Do we find it difficult to say praise the Lord? When we find ourselves in a situation where we can give a testimony does our testimony often start with I rather than praise? Revelation chapter 20. And we're looking at verses 4 to 8. The highlight verse in this section would basically be verse 6. But I'll go back and start at verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Now, can you recall in your study of scripture anywhere where people were given authority to judge? What do you know about the 12 apostles? What do you know about the environment you will find yourself in when you accept Christ as your saviour and you abide in his love for the rest of your days? The dead will be judged. But Jesus said, you will judge we are going to be given a task that we would probably freely admit we are not at this point of time really ready for. 
I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus. Do you think you would ever get your head chopped off because of your testimony for Jesus? If, that, if somebody came through that door wielding a great axe, would you be trembling because you know your head's going to be cut off because you have kept a testimony for Jesus? Once we move into what's going to happen in the future as these closing chapters in Revelation do, it often tends to stop us thinking about what has happened in our immediate past, our past past, our ancient past. And because of the word of God. Now here is something that you've got to put together. The testimony for Jesus and the word of God. Are they two separate things? Think on that as you munch on your lunch. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. If I were to talk to any of you at this moment about the first resurrection, you would say, yes, that is what I'm striving to be at. So the beatitude here is blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them and they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now I have an ambition to live to be a hundred. I might have shared this previously but when I'm looking at something like a thousand years and I look at my lifetime of a hundred years and I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do for a thousand years? And so as you read a bit further on, the second death has no power over those who take part in the first resurrection but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Always difficult to get to grips with what is contained within this word priests. We often talk about kings and priests, but priests were essentially known because they interceded on people's behalf. You will only ever be a priest during the millennium if you have effectively worked at interceding on behalf of other people. All of us become at times concerned with where I am at at this point in my life. But once you have accepted Christ as your saviour, I is no longer the operative word. It is more, we can use a biblical word, neighbour. When you are spending time relaxing, reflecting, meditating, have you ever stopped to wonder how many times you use the word I in your prayer life, in your meditations, in your reflections? I once had the son of a senior elder, not at this church, who I'd taken the prayer for the divine service at this particular church. <laughs> and this young man's father came up to me and said, do you know my son counted the number of times you said I in your prayer? And I said, do I really need to ask? <laughs> he said, no, you would be a little bit ashamed if you did. So we have this ego tripping. Now, we won't call it tripping so much. That has a different connotation. But you have this ego problem. 
as uh, one group used to sing, ego is not a dirty word. It is not a dirty word. But what happens to it is the baggage that it takes on when ego, I, become the central word. Jesus taught us to place more focus on members of our family, people we work with, people we go to school with, people we meet. And when any one or any number of those people start to impact your life and you think, oh, I better get out of this person's environment, that's when you've got to stop and think. Because what Satan wants to do is remove you. Because you are there professing to be Christ's special messenger. In company with all of you guys, this is what we believe. There's much that can be said about the dragon's influence and so on, but I think we'll move through now to Revelation chapter 22. And it will be verses 1 through 7. And it opens up in actual fact with one of these blessings. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. And so this starts to parallel what John opened up with right from the word go. Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and take it to heart. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Has the book of Revelation become so involved in our lives that we really don't pay a great deal of attention to it? We are a people who often made much about the books of Daniel and Revelation. The purpose was to bring the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And as you look at that rather straightforward division, by and large, it is the Old Testament that gives us the greatest examples outside of Christ himself in what I would term is effective Christian living. Indeed, you see Jesus in the New Testament refers often to the Old Testament. But when you come to see him relating with those that he called to be his disciples, his apostles, there are times consistently when he did not have a good word to say about them because they had not yet been able to understand. In their day, John hadn't even written his revelation. But John, if we understand things correctly, was one of those who followed Jesus. So these words are meant for us to consider, to reflect upon, to see Jesus, to call on the Holy Spirit, to acknowledge the sovereignty of the Father. But in closing, Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 to 17. And again, repetition. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. How often do you reflect on those words? My reward is is with me. Do you rub your hands together and say, oh, I wonder what he's got for me. Those who are probably a little bit more attuned to spiritual realities will say, just to be with Jesus for eternity is reward enough. Take it or leave it. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. 
and some of the parables that talk about the number of talents that have been palmed out, etc., etc. You know, I like being facetious at times, so in using that illustration, I'd like to say, oh yes, I'm just a one-talent man. But you know, deep down, that's not really true. One would always hope to be a multi-talented person. But then again, how often does hope become reality? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Now, this is a, a, a phrase that means also keep the commandments. And I was watching on YouTube a um, United States retired professor talking about the problem with washing robes in blood because it's not a biblical statement. It just says wash their robes. So you look beyond how you get up and dress yourself first thing in the morning and instead rather look at something like Revelation chapter 3 and the message to Laodicea. I counsel you I give you this advice, buy of me gold, clothing, I sell. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life. You've got to wash to have the right. Is that what that verse is saying? Obedience. We ought to understand the tension that exists between what people say, Christ, only Christ, and when we say, you are rewarded for your faithfulness, because people don't generally want to tack on that last little bit. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus. And I mentioned before about a misplaced focus on I. So if we get caught up in that situation, you could do to remember Revelation twenty-two sixteen, I, Jesus. Your relationship with God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit ought to be of such that you can say, I, Jesus. Jesus living in me and through me. Give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride. Remember that bride we reflected on earlier at this big wedding supper? The bride say, come. Now John is writing in the present tense at the time when he wrote this revelation. He's come back to present realities. The bride and the spirit say, come. And let him who hears. Now you've had a long-winded preacher in your ears today. Don't forget some of the things I've said. Probably come back next week and if I would ask you the question, you would probably say, oh, what was that all about? But don't worry too much about it. Let him who hears say, come. You've got to issue an invitation to the people that you come in contact with, the people that you work with, the people that you live with. It isn't always easy to do it off the hat. Sometimes you may meet a person today and circumstances or inclination don't have you giving that person an invitation. But that person could come back into your life. 
Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. That is the only drink worth having. God bless you and thank you for being here today. Let us pray. Hallelujah. 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 Four times. Praise be to God. Simple word, hallelujah, the Lord. You know the heart of each one of us, some of us. It probably doesn't function all that often in our day-to-day -day living. But we know that because we have given our lives to you, that you will give us such an outpouring of your spirit that we will indeed hear the hallelujah chorus sung more often. We hope and pray that in this small group here this morning there is not one that will not see the Lord coming in the clouds of glory, those angels that will descend with him will be singing hallelujah, 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 Lord, hallelujah. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Amen.